Genesis chapter 27. Uh, you'll find that on page 21. Page 21. Uh, we're not going to read the whole chapter at here. this point, but we're going to read the first 13 verses. Genesis chapter 27 okay. on page 21. When Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could not see, he called his older son Esau and said to him, My son. And he answered, Here I am. He said, Look, I am old and do not know the day of my death. Take your hunting gear, your quiver and bow and go out in the field to hunt some game for me. Then make me the delicious food that I love and bring it to me to eat so that I can bless you before I die. Now, Rebekah was listening to what Isaac said to his son, Esau. So while Esau went to the field to hunt some game to bring in, Rebekah said to her son, Jacob, Listen, I heard your father talking with your brother Esau. He said, Bring me some game and make some delicious food for me to eat so that I can bless you in the Lord's presence before I die. Now obey every order I give you, my son. Go to the flock and bring me two choice young goats and I'll make them into a delicious meal for your father, the kind he loves. Then take it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. Jacob answered Rebekah, his mother, Look, my brother Esau is a hairy man, but I'm a man with smooth skin. Suppose my father touches me, then I'll seem to be deceiving him and I'll bring a curse rather than a blessing on myself. His mother said to him, your curse be on me, my son. Just obey me and go and get them for me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're going to spend a bit of time in Genesis 27. There's a sermon outline there. If you open up your new sheet, God willing, there'll be an opportunity for questions at the end. But I want to begin with a question that you don't often get. How do you handle God's will? Now, it seems like a strange question. How often are you asked what you do with the revealed will of the transcendent God of the universe? Seems strange when you phrase it like that, doesn't it? But it's actually a fairly practical and relevant question. You see, we're all gathered here today, aren't we? And just by gathering here in this way, we're saying we identify as Christians. Now, if you do that, you're saying that you call God your Father. You call Jesus your Lord and you regard the Holy Spirit as your counsellor. Think about all of those relationships because they all make an explicit statement about how you handle the will of God, the will of your Father, Lord, and Counselor. To call ourselves Christians, to be gathered like this, is to identify as people who hold a certain book called the Bible as the revealed will and word of the God of the universe, the revelation of his character and identity. So how do you handle it? What do you do with it? I think there are three ways we can handle God's will as we see it in his word and all have consequences. Uh, the first option is very simple. Who cares? I'm going to do what I want and hang the consequences. That's a fairly simple option, isn't it? Option two is a little more subtle. I know God's will is this. But that way is characterised by people who know what God's revealed will is, who understand exactly that God says this in the Bible and then choose to do the exact opposite. To put it bluntly, to disobey. I've just read an article in a book put out by the Anglican Church of Australia on some issues in our society. The article was written by a man called Matthew Anstey. He's a prominent Anglican priest ordained in the Diocese of Adelaide. He says very clearly that he understands and knows and treasures that the Bible is God's word and is very clear. 
He then says we must understand this word in the context of our own lived experience. So as Anstey says very clearly, the Bible says marriage is between one man and one woman, but he chooses to ignore God's very clear word and understands it based on his lived experience and then actively disobeys it. The third option is a little more subtle, even more. I know God's will is so. This is characterized by knowing that God's will says this, but, you know, I I just don't know if God's up for it today. Just don't know if he's capable. I just don't know if I can trust him. So I better take matters into my own hands because he really needs me to bring about his will. We've had some classic examples of that in Genesis, haven't we? Just remember back to God's promise to Abraham and Sarah. I will give you a family. I know God's will, so I just don't know if God's up for it. Just don't know whether God can do it. Remember Hagar and Ishmael? Really, this could be understood as the ends justified the means. Now, I want to pause there and give you, us, a moment to think about those three options. To think about how we, you or I, handle God's word. Just want to give you a moment. Well, in today's episode, which is really well known, we see all of these options displayed. And let me tell you, by the end, it looks pretty messy, doesn't it? And this one truth comes out. It is only God's will itself that emerges unscathed and faithful. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Thanks for Lego. Uh, Thanks for great kids' talks. Thanks for terrific music. Thanks for gathering together in comfort. Thanks for your word, your revealed will, which creates us, confronts us, saves us, gathers us, and forms us. Please apply to us today by your Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, at point two on the outline, uh, if you cast your mind back to the end of the last chapter, Genesis 26, it's not really a great start to this episode. Uh, Verse 34 of Genesis 26, when Esau was 40 years old, he took as his wife Judith, daughter of Beeri the Hittite, and Basimath, daughter of Elon the Hittite. They made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. Like father, like son? Not quite. They both got married at the same age, didn't they? Notice that, 40 years old. But do you notice what Esau does? In the light of his father's marriage, in the light of his grandfather's great efforts and very clear instructions, what does Esau do? I don't do what I want, hang the consequences. The result is bitterness, isn't it, within the family? Did you notice that? There's great bitterness within the family at these decisions. I think in essence Esau is option one. I know God's will, but I'm just going to do what I want. And it doesn't really fill you with great confidence as the story begins to unfold. Look at verse 1. When Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could not see, he called his older son Esau and said to him, My son. And he answered, Here I am. He said, Look, I'm old and do not know the day of my death. Take your hunting gear, your quiver and bow and go out in the field to hunt some game for me. Then make me the delicious food that I love. And bring it to me to eat so that I can bless you before I die. Well, the contrast is immediate. Remember when we had the same description for Abraham in his old age? How wonderfully warm and content the image was. It's not here, is it? Here's a man who is frail and he's not serene, doesn't seem satisfied or content. He makes some decisions here that stand against the very clear will of God, don't they? Remember Genesis chapter 25, verse 23, And the Lord said to Rebekah, 
Two nations are in your womb. Two people will come from you and be separated. One people will be stronger than the other and the older will serve the younger. God's will, very clear, out of his character expressed in grace, the older will serve the younger. Isaac knows that truth that's safe to assume and yet what does Isaac do? Everything that he does at this point should cause us concern. Every other deathbed blessing in the Bible from a father to the next generation involves the whole family. What does Isaac do here? Only calls one in the family. He is secretive. Isaac knows exactly what he's doing. He's cutting out the younger and aiming to bless the older who has just brought explicit bitterness to the family. Isaac is driven by his guts, isn't he? Did you notice that? Why is he going to give this blessing? Well, he's going to give this blessing based on a bowl of stew. He's just like his son Esau, driven by his base instincts. He's going to give the blessing for a bowl of stew. Does that sound familiar? Remember how that started to turn out? Well, the episode is alarming. Here's a man driven by his guts, by his sensual love to disobey the will of God. Isaac knows God's will, doesn't he? But in an act of explicit disobedience, he chooses to try to bless the older, the one not chosen by God. What's lacking here? Well, it's obedience to the will of God, isn't it? Isaac knows that will. Isaac knows how clear it is, but he chooses to hear and disobey, to know and do the opposite, to actively act in disobedience. Well, Rebecca's heard all these preparations. I'm at point three on the outline. It's very hard not to eavesdrop when you're camping in a tent. (laughs) She hears it all. And her response is in contrast, isn't it? Look there in verse five. I'm at point three. Now, Rebecca was listening to what Isaac said to his son Esau. So while Esau went to the field to hunt some game and to bring in, Rebecca said to her son Jacob, listen, I heard your father talking to your brother Esau. He said, bring me some game and make some delicious food for me to eat so that I can bless you in the Lord's presence before I die. Now obey every order I give you, my son. Go to the flock and bring me two choice young goats. I'll make them into a delicious meal for your father, the kind he loves. Then take it to your father to eat, so that he may bless you before he dies. Do you see the family tension bubbling up? Remember the favoritism from earlier on? Do you notice it there in verses 5 to 6? Esau, Isaac spoke to his son Esau. Rebekah spoke to her son Jacob. Isaac knew the will of God but disobeyed it. Rebecca knows the will of God, so she takes matters into her own hands, doesn't she? She's threatened by Isaac's disobedience, and so she shows a, a devious distrust in God's ability, power, and capacity. God's not up for it. Isaac's going to steal it. So I'm going to step in and make sure it happens. Remember all those attributes that made us stand out at that well to the household manager? They all come to the fore here as she decides to do things she thinks God is incapable of doing. And the interaction is just as disturbing as the one between Isaac and Esau. The the account of Isaac's word is exaggerated and untrue. She's lying. Her plan takes advantage of an old man and his failing faculties. She's deceptive. The plan is authoritarian and characterized by falsity. She's pragmatic. And Jacob, well, he's less worried about the ethics of the matter and more about getting caught. And when you read verse 10, then take it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. The ends justify the means, don't they? And Jacob joins in. Rebecca knew the revealed will of God. 
Her response is not the explicit disobedience of Isaac, but the lack of trust that God can do what he promised. Faced by Isaac's plans, Rebecca seems to doubt that God can deliver, so she takes matters into her own hands. Whatever the cost, she's going to make this promise come true, even if God seems incapable. What's lacking here? Well, it's trust, isn't it? That God can do as he promised. That God has the capacity, the ability, the desire to do as he promised. Ultimately, it means that the ends justify the means. Deception, lying, falsity, they're all okay if the outcome is good. The result of these two options? Well, I'm at point four on the outline. It's a destructive mess, isn't it? The story is told so skillfully. The tension is built, the suspense is there, and it just heightens our awareness of the deception of Rebecca and Jacob, the failed insight of Isaac, who is driven by his guts to disobedience. Remember that man who once brought his whole life before God? And Jacob perpetuates the deception. Isaac suspects that something is going on, but his passions and desires drive him. His passion for stew, the smell of the field, the feel of the hair on his favourite son's arms. His senses fail him just as his obedience to the will of God fails him. And when you look at verse 27, you'll see that the whole blessing, the blessing that Isaac wanted to go to the older, goes to the younger. When Isaac smelled his clothes, he blessed him and said, Ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give to you from the dew of the sky, from the richness of the land, an abundance of grain and new wine. May people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brothers. May your mother's sons bow down to you. Those who curse you will be cursed. Those who bless you will be blessed. All the major themes of the promise to Abraham are echoed, aren't they? Just go back through and you'll see Genesis 12, Genesis 17, Genesis 25, Genesis 26, all pass to the... Well, not the older, is it? They pass to the younger, just as God intended, but which Isaac wanted to avoid. What God said would take place has occurred. Not because the humans have proved trustworthy or obedient, but because God has shown himself relentlessly faithful. As Jacob leaves by one door, so Esau enters by another door, and the tension is palpable. When you read it, the emotion is high and the pain is obvious. The deceit is exposed. Isaac trembles uncontrollably. Esau cries out loudly and in bitterness. There is vicious language, desperation, desire, bitter weeping. The climax... Well, Esau receives everything. Well, actually, he receives nothing, does he? Look there in verse 39. Then his father Isaac answered him, Look, your dwelling place will be away from the richness of the land, away from the dew of the sky above. You'll live by your sword. You'll serve your brother. But when you rebel, you'll break his yoke from your neck. Again, God's word is fulfilled, isn't it? God's will is exposed. And the two nations are separated. The two nations are at loggerheads. The conflict of the womb is now the violence of the world. And the older will serve the younger. And the repercussions, the repercussions in verses 41 to 46 just flow out. Esau decides to walk the path of Cain, doesn't he? He expresses in his heart the murderous desire to kill his brother and the camp finds out. Rebecca, she hears and continues her ends justify the means can do attitude, doesn't she? Even now she does not trust that God will protect this boy and so she manipulates Isaac again who's still failing in his senses, still driven by his guts and Rebecca plays him. She gets 
Jacob sent away for a matter of days, but she will never again see her favorite son, will she? She will die not laying eyes on Jacob ever again. Esau will wander off and the family is divided. What a mess. What a mess. How do you handle God's will? How do you handle God's will? That's a pretty raw and emotional, brutal episode, isn't it? It's worth thinking about that question as we look at it. How do we handle God's will? I think there is one truth that should stand firm and stark against all others here. God's will is consistent and faithful. In the messiness of the deception of relationships here, what emerges as constant? God's will, God's desire, God's promise, God's word. Just as God said, even though every human effort was against him, just as God said, the promise moved from Isaac to Jacob. The failure of the humans isn't excused. They don't avoid their responsibility or culpability. It's really a warts and all account. Their failure to rightly handle God's will is massively destructive to each other, but notice that it never destroys the commitment of God. Isn't that good? Isn't it good that God's commitment persists in our messiness? God's commitment to roll back sin and bring blessing to heal our brokenness despite us persisting in brokenness. God says, I am committed and I will do it. I am open about this and it will succeed despite your efforts and for your great good. Isn't it strange to finish a series on Genesis at this point? We're not going to come back to Genesis until next year. But really, it's a point of thanks, isn't it, that in the messiness that we see here, God's will proceeds for our good. Here's our great hope. If we were just left looking at this family, there wouldn't be any hope, would there? But here is our great hope, the God who stands behind them. But there's there's still a sharpness here, isn't there? There's still a confrontation here because when we think about God's will, God's will is his character. God's will is his nature. God's word reveals who God is. So how we handle God's will is how we handle God. How we deal with his nature, how we respond to him himself. And so gathered together as people who identify publicly just by being here as part of God's family, we are now asked, how do we handle the will of God? What do we do with God himself? Now, option one's very easy. Remember Esau? We know that out there, don't we? <laughs> Options two and three are a little sharper, aren't they? Because that's Isaac and Rebecca. Do we recognize ourselves in them? You see, I, th- I think we're meant to look at these two grand figures of our history and see ourselves. I know the will of God, but I know the will of God, so. Uh, there's some Bible references there on your outline. Let me read them as clear statements of the will of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Deuteronomy 6, listen Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These are the words that I'm giving you today to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. 1 Peter 2, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Matthew 6, 
Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be provided for you. Philippians 4. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence, if there is any praise, dwell on these things. I know the will of God, but I know the will of God, so I don't know about you, but I read those verses and I find them terribly confronting. I find them deeply sobering. Is there any hope for me as one of God's people? Or is my past, present and future doomed to be like Isaac and Rebekah's, Esau and Jacob's? Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and he told the disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. Taking along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is swallowed up in sorrow to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake with me. Going a little farther, he fell face down and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to his disciples and he found them sleepy. He asked Peter, So couldn't you stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray so that you won't enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. Again, a second time he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, Your will be done. And he came again and found them sleepy because they could not keep their eyes open. Here is a man who knows the will of God. How does he handle it? How does he handle it constantly? Not once, not just occasionally, but his whole life. Not easy, not pleasant. Certainly put him outside the bounds of polite society, didn't it? How does he handle it? Remember what Steve asked the kids to say? Faithful obedience. Faithful obedience. He's not like his great ancestor Isaac. He obeyed God no matter the cost. He's not like his great ancestor Rebecca. He trusted that God could do exactly as he promised. And so he's not just an example, though he's at least that, isn't he? He's a template, a model for how to handle the will of God. He's not just that, but what is he? In his faithful obedience, he is our saviour. He is what we need to be when we can't be that, by our very own nature. His faithful obedience forgives our sins. The promise to Abraham is fulfilled. We can come back to God and call him Father. And his will is achieved in a very messy event, isn't it? By Jesus' faithful obedience, we are not just shown what it means to handle God's will. We are given the handling of God's will for our good, for our forgiveness. So let me finish with these three very brief questions. Do you know God's will? that he loves you, that he put his image upon you and wants to resurrect you and, and reform you and restore you, that he wants to deal with you so that your sin is taken away. Do you know Jesus who kneels when we sleep so that he is faithfully obedient when we are not so that our sins are forgiven? Do you know how to handle God's will in faithful obedience as part of his family? Let me pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you are persistent in your mercy, that your son is faithfully obedient when we are not, and that in him we have what we need. Father, please forgive us, please restore us, please enable us to handle your will 
in faithful obedience. Amen. Any questions? Baxter. Yep. Yep. No, that's right. And I said I said that in the sermon, didn't I? Because it shows the family breakdown and shows what happens in Genesis 25, verse 28. Isaac favoured Esau and Rebekah favoured Jacob. Yeah, does that make sense? Terrific. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Go, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it is. It is because that's the word. Those are the words we've got on the page. So you can kind of approach that in two ways, can't you? So Pete's question's a good one. How how would God's will have happened? I don't know how it would have happened, but it would have. But just because it would have happened, it doesn't justify her pragmatism and her lack of trust. And so I think she's held up as an anti mirror. Not uh, this is how you should do it, but as do you recognise yourself in this? What's lacking in her? She didn't trust God to do it, so she went, you little ripper, I can do it myself. So, yeah, it's hard to get your brain around it, and I, and I agree with you because I kind of got to the end of that passage and go, oh, hasn't God just justified the means by doing the ends? Well, no, no, God's just done what he promised despite humans mucking it up.